good evening everybody and i welcome you for this month's perinatal academics for the month of june i think we have an excellent session or interactive session on congenital diaphragmatic hernia we have the pediatric obstetric and the pediatric surgery perspective to be presented by the experts we recently had a case of congenital diaphragmatic hernia i think first the pediatrician would present followed by we will have a discussion on how do we prognosticate antenatally when we have a antenatal scan showing congenital diaphragmatic hernia we will also listen from the pediatric surgeon what are the challenges in management what are the outcomes we have in the current era so first to moderate this session i think we have two excellent experts with us we have uh, dr chandrika anand who is actually in charge of our high risk pregnancy clinic at ovam banashankari i think most of the obstetricians would know madam madam is quite senior obstetrician and who has a special interest with high risk clinic and we also have dr vandana krishna with us who is the in charge obstetrician of shreya hospital kolar so to begin with i think i invite dr sunil i invite dr sunil to present the pediatric part over to you sunil uh, good evening everyone so with the pretty much delay we'll uh, proceed with our evening presentation friends so the uh, index case that we have is a 30 year old prime gravid mother who uh, who came with uh, came to us in a walk in delivery her anomaly scan done outside at 20th weeks of gestation was normal the mother was in use for normal vaginal delivery at 40 plus 1 weeks of gestation in uh, in however the mother was proceeded to emergency lcs in view of non progression of labor and meconium stain lichen soon after the delivery the baby sub gas were good but soon the baby developed respiratory distress soon after birth at zero hours of life which was uh, uh, the, the probable diagnosis kept was probably in secondary to suspected meconium aspiration syndrome or suspected uh, transient tachypnea of newborn and started on and whether the baby was started on blender oxygen the baby was made up was made of oxygen by 6 hours of life uh, after observation for next another 12 hours the baby was shifted to mother side at 18 as hours of life however on day 3 of life the baby developed new onset of respiratory distress when the baby was on mother side in your office baby was shifted to the nicu the chest x ray done on admission to nicu was this chest on herniation of bowel loops into the left side of the thoracic cavity and the heart was pushed to the right side so good evening everyone uh, so in our evening talk i'll be presenting an approach to a case of a congenital diaphragmatic hernia so today's learning objectives will be what is congenital diaphragmatic hernia what is the presentation and diagnosis delivery room management timing of the surgery pre op stabilization of the baby and post op management and follow up coming to what is congenital diaphragmatic hernia it is a developmental defect in the diaphragm which allows abdominal contents to herniate into the chest its incidence is 1 in 2000 to 5000 births worldwide and most commonly it is seen on the left side of the diaphragm which is posteriorly called or otherwise called as the bostelex hernia in most of the 70% of cases it can also occur on the right side and rarely bilaterally coming to embryology it occurs due to the defective development of the septum transversum leading to the agenesis of the diaphragm which can be either on the left side which is most common as we discussed earlier or on the right side anteriorly or posteriorly rarely it can also be seen in the central if it is seen anteriorly it is also called morgagni hernia whereas in post seen left side left posteriorly it is called a bostelex hernia coming to the presentations antenatal ultrasound done uh, an antenatal ultrasound the baby shows that there is presence of a stomach uh, stomach bubble at the same level as that of the heart there is a mediastinal shift and a presence of liver in the thorax and polyhydramnios in most of the cases neonatal presentation at uh, within first few hours of the life you find that there is a mediastinal shift and the baby has a scapular abdomen due to the herniation of the bowel loops into the chest postnatally uh, in older infants we can also uh, babies can have respiratory distress in, in cases where right sided cds which uh, presents late we can see that baby has a uh, symptoms 
similar to that of a pneumonia coming to the diagnosis antenatally we can pick up uh, cds as early as up to 6 weeks of gestation in ultrasound scans earlier the gestational age poorer is uh, poor is the prognosis is what has been observed preterm delivery is not advised in these cases uh, the fetal lung head ratio is a prognostic ma marker which will be discussed with uh, by our obstetric friend postnatally we diagnose by uh, doing a chest plus abdominal x ray the other differential diagnosis uh, kept in view of uh, such an x ray or such a symptom presentation is that diaphragmatic eventuation congenital adenomatoid malformations pulmonary sequestration bronchogenic cysts coming to the delivery room management we need uh, we need in case the uh, the diagnosis has been established prior to delivery through an ultrasonogram we need a two personal train in advanced nrp if the baby in case the baby has respiratory distress soon after birth there are two situations in case it is mild you start on nasal prongs oxygen and wait in case there is a retraction grunt or a higher fi2 requirement on uh, nasal prongs oxygen we promptly intubate using after intubation, we insert a 10 French double lumen replogue uh, tube and continue and start on continuous suctions or uh, uh, remember bag mask uh, CPAP are strictly contraindicated in the case which has been previously diagnosed with CDH antenatally. And we need to rule out other anomalies soon after birth, such as the neural tube defects, which can commonly be seen, and associated congenital heart diseases. In order to which we need a, we do a screening echo, and spine deformities such as scoliosis are also seen. Coming to the next question, when to operate? Do do we need to stabilize or can we directly take for surgery? This is our next question. So evidence suggests, according to our Cochrane evidence suggests that we need to stabilize the patient first and then operate, which of usually improves our outcomes. Coming to pre-stabilization, re-op stabilization, we are focus uh, majority, of time, majority of the time, majority of the time on reducing the barotrauma and stabilizing or improving the pulmonary hypertension. Permissive hypercapnia is a rule, and avoiding hypoxia and acid as important as it reduces the pulmonary hypertension. Venous and arterial uh, lines that to be placed are preferably placed peripherally rather than through the UAC or UVC because it might cause a hindrance to the surgery. So we target, target, saturation target, uh, each keep are from 85% to 5%, to target of 45 to 60, PS target of 7.25 to 7.4. The pulmonary hypertension status prior to surgery determines the outcome of the surgery, uh, outcome of the baby. Heavy sedation and paralysis of the baby are often avoided as uh, in, uh, because the spontaneous uh, breath of uh, breathing efforts of the baby can uh, decrease the barotrauma. And we need to rule out other uh, associated anomalies prior to surgery. And NPO, as we know, prior six to four hours prior to surgery. Uh, one of the important aspects of pre-op stabilization is stabilizing the permanent, primary pulmonary hypertension that the baby develops. The severity of the PPHN determines the outcome and mortality of the baby. INO is the first drug of uh, treatment of choice in such a case. Inhaled nitrocosticide is, however, contraindicated when the baby has a left ventricular dysfunction. First drug of choice in the treatment of this PPHN is mildly known, followed by vasopressin. Sildenafil can cause hypotension and is often avoided in acute cases or acute phases. Sildenafil and bosentan so can be used in case the baby has a chronic pulmonary hypertension. Coming to the ventilation strategies, conventional mode of SIMV is preferred uh, because multiple retrospective studies have shown that it is, it is more efficacious than other modes. So we, we can go up to a maximum of uh, PIP of 25 mm of H2O and a PEEP of up to 5 and the respiratory rate up to 30 to 40. Permanent hypercapnia is, uh, uh, is uh, allowed and barotrauma is to be avoided. Coming to HFO mode of ventilation, uh, HFO mode of ventilation is often used as a rescue mode and not used initially, which usually facilitates gaseous exchange uh, by sending a steady stream of small tidal volumes into the airway using relatively low uh, PIPs, which reduces barotrauma. And the map is usually adjusted, adjusted 
by uh, taking the uh, expansion of the contralateral lung into consideration. Coming to post-op management, ventilation depends on the presence of PH or a lung hypoplasia that is currently there. And we focus on minimizing the pulmonary hypertension even post-operatively. Uh, post and hemodynamic respiratory monitoring is to be done strictly. And adequate pseudo-analgesia is considered so the baby does not move. And uh, muscle relaxants are avoided as much as possible as it can cause hearing impairment in the future. Surgical wound care is to be done. And in uh, babies, nutrition or the feeding is started once that the gastric bowel uh, aspirates are nil and the bowel sounds are present. Post-op stabilization. In our index case, uh, baby, baby was started on in a, in a PSIMV mode of ventilation soon after the surgery and was kept on PSIMV ventilation till the day six post-op and was slowly tapered and was extubated to venti CPAP under the DEXA cover. The baby was screened for other anomalies and USG, uh, USG spine and KUB and a 2D echo was done, which showed a mesocardia and no other obvious structural abnormalities. Follow-up is as important as the treatment as we find that babies can have uh, hearing uh, hearing loss uh, followed by other GI, uh, GI issues such as GERD. Hence, the upper GI study and hearing evaluation uh, such as BERA is as essential as the surgery. Coming to our final take-home message, with advancement of antimicrobial ultrasound, congenital diaphragmatic hernia have been picked up earlier, uh, detected antenatally, which surgery has been uh, has to be done only after cardiac and respiratory stabilization, as discussed. I you know is a drug of choice, and uh, conventional SIMB mode is the mode of ventilation uh, preferred. Sildenafil is often avoided in acute cases of uh, pulmonary hypertension. The baby is to be screened in follow up uh, for hearing and G uh, hearing for hearing and uh, GRD. Thank you. So this is the x-ray of the baby prior to surgery and this is our x-ray post-surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil, for presenting the pediatric no, aspect. And uh, this was one odd case where no, anti no, scans did not give us no, any clue. It was a walk-in delivery. So we didn't have any clue about CDH in the delivery room. Fortunately, baby required only oxygen in the delivery room. So day three, we picked up the case of CDH. So to present the obstetric challenges or how do we handle when we have an antenatal scan showing CDH? I think I now invite Dr. Pranavi to present the obstetric part. So I think we can have questions at the end. Pranavi, you can actually share your screen. Favorite Your screen is visible. Can you hear me? Yes, it's visible. Can you mute everyone except the speaker? Sir, can you hear me? How many? I can hear you. You, you can proceed, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Pranavi, Consulate Obstetrician in Ovum Hospital, Hoskote Branch. Today, I will be presenting the approach towards the congenital diaphragmatic hernia, the obstructed perspective. So we all know what is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia and already Sunil has discussed about the embryology part. So I'll be just keeping the initial slides. So we know that uh, diaphragmatic hernia is a birth defect of the diaphragm through which the abdominal contents will enter into the thorax. So the incidence, if you come into that, it is one, to four per 10,000 pregnancies. That is almost one per every 2,000 to 2,500 live births. So that normally the development starts around six to 10 weeks of gestation that in the fetal life because why do this the hernia happens is normally there are four structures are needed for the development of the diaphragm. These structures come together and fuse to form the diaphragm. These are the septum transversum, pleuroperitoneal membrane, uh, peripheral body walls of muscle and mesentery of the es esophagus. When there is any defect or when there is a difficulty in the fusion, when there is a not fused any of these structures, will result in the formation of the hernia, diaphragmatic hernia. Most commonly, it is the pleuroperitoneal membrane which causes the problem. In this picture, we can see that the blue structure is the pleuroperitoneal membrane. 
crucially there will be two cavities that is pericardio peritoneal canals will be present in this area which later on will be covered by this membrane when there is a failure of the formation of this membrane usually results in the formation of this hernia So whenever this, there are two types of hernia, as we all learned about this in our MBBS levels. One is Bogdalak hernia, other is the Borgogneus hernia. The Bogdalak hernia can be on the right and left side. The most common is the left-sided one, which is the most commonly we will be seeing. The Morcagnian hernia will be rare and it will be on the right side most commonly. So today I'll be discussing about the what is the role of ultrasound, role of MRI, associated anomalies in the CDH and the counseling part. So we'll take about through a clinical history. We are discussing about a 25 years primary gravida who is referred to our center. It's a second opinion in view of suspected congenital diaphragmatic hernia. This lady, they have not undergone any NT scan at the first trimester. And they have not, and this congenital diaphragmatic hernia was not detected at the anomaly scan level. The report was given to be normal. At the same center, when they have done the growth scan, at 28 weeks, they found out the possibility of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. This is the most common picture we all come through in the obstetric OPDs. That is the reason we have thought of discussing this case. So how do we approach for these cases? First of all, we need to reconfirm the diagnosis by senior expert sonologist or fetal medicine specialist. Along with that, we have to, I mean, whenever they have done an ultrasound, usually after confirming the diagnosis of diaphragmatic hernia, to look for the structures, what are there in the thorax, either it can be stomach or bowels or liver. Along with that, the next thing is we should look out, is that it's only the diaphragmatic hernia we're seeing or it is associated with any other structural anomalies. Following these identifications, then we have to make a prediction of the outcome so that how do we explain them or counsel the family further. So for suspicion of CDH will happen when we see the stomach in the thorax. And the second thing is the dextro position or extreme levo position of the heart. See, how do we differentiate whether the levo position or extreme levo, I mean, dextro position or levo position of the heart is? We have to make sure that the apex of the heart, when you're seeing an ultrasound, the apex of the heart will be visible. Even, I mean, apex of the heart will be towards the facing the left side only. Even the heart is pushed to right side. That is the time when we have to think about the other complications or anomalies. See, when you're looking at this picture in this slide, this is the abdominal surface circumference, usually when the sonologist will be taking. In this picture, we are seeing the stomach is in the here, and the umbilical vein, a portal vein is the one. The other thing is the liver. These are the planes we should be making sure when you are taking an ultrasound. Usually, when you're taking the abdominal circumference, that is the abdomen, we should be considering of taking at three levels, so the upper abdomen, mid abdomen, and the lower abdomen. When you're looking at the upper, upper abdomen, you should make sure that the stomach portal vein and the liver is visible and this is the thoracic view in this in this view also should make sure that right lung left lung and the heart should be visible in this plane this is if we are taking these planes properly usually the major cdhs may not be missed so what are the associated anomalies we'll be seeing along with the congenital diaphragmatic cavity the most common will be the congenital heart diseases uh, one third of the cases of uh, diaphragmatic hernias are associated with that heart diseases. That is the reason we should ask once the anomaly scan is done and has been diagnosed with CDH, we should reconfirm the diagnosis and a fetal echo should be followed along with it. The most common heart diseases are ASD, VSD, coactation of iota, PDA and vascular things. The gastrointestinal anomalies are the cleft palate, omphalocele, esophageal atresia are visible along with CDH and central nervous system of neural tube defects. Along with the structural anomalies, we are also able to see these CDHs in the chromosomal anomalies that is considering to 5 to 15%. Usually most commonly it will be seen in trisomy 21 and 18. Even 13 and some micro deletions are also, these CDHs are visible. The non-chromosomal syndromes, which are also be, which are monogenic conditions, there are few conditions where we are seeing the CDH. These are Friant syndrome in which CDH is associated along with 
unilateral cleft lip or palate, micrognathia, and CNS anomalies. Palestine Killian syndrome, also associated with CDH, the abnormal profile that is small, nose, and thin upper lip with mesomelic hypoplasia. Beckwith Friedman syndrome, that is CDH with macroglacia, somatic hemihypertrophy, polycystic kidneys, and example loss. So these are the initial things. See how next thing is after considering the anomalies, everything we should predict the outcome. Why do we need to do the prediction? Is once to after the prediction only we can counsel the patient how further we are going to plan the pregnancy. What are the predictors do we have? Is one is the lung size, the second is the liver position, and the third is the stomach position. Lung size plays the major role in the prediction of the outcome. It is the lung to head ratio. And the second one is absorbed by expected lung to head ratio. These two are the ultrasound measurements. The other one is absorbed by expected total fetal lung volume is by MRI. See, this is the lung to head ratio. I'll just explain in detail how to take the lung to head ratio. So in this picture, we are seeing this is the right lung. Right lung here is okay. This this picture we are seeing the thoracic part where we are seeing the stomach content this is the left lung right lung along with the heart so when you are measuring the lung to head ratio this is the area of the lung to the head circumference we are taking the ratio the area of the lung includes the control atrial lung not the lung which is affected that is when the herniation is on the right left side that is stomach we are taking the ratio of the lung on the right side so area of the lung is measured divided by head circumference. So when this ratio is measured, if the value is less than one, the prognosis is poor. And when it is one to 1.4, then we need the baby may need the ECMO at birth. And if it is more than 1.4, the prognosis is good. And the second thing is, initially they were following the lung to head ratio in the initial part of the, I mean, initial years. Now they understood that the lung growth is faster than the head circumference. So they have changed with the measurements. That is, LHR changes over gestation as lung grows more rapidly than head circumference. After that, they started doing the absorbed by expected lung to head ratio. What is absorbed by expected? Absorbed is what we get at present. That is a lung to lung to head circumference ratio. What is the expected is? These are all web calculated values. So already the web, when it contains to that particular gestation, what is the expected LHR? So based on that, the data, I mean, the calculator will give us the values. What is the, once we get the value, if the value is more than 45%, the survival rate of the fetus will be 100%. If the value is less than 25%, the survival rate is poor. The same thing when you turn to the right side, the value should be more than 45% because the chances of survival were less in the right side at CDH. The next comes is the liver. This is again an independent risk factor next to the lung size. Liver that is up or down. That is upside liver means the liver is present in the thorax. Down is the liver is present in the abdomen. Whenever the liver is present in the thorax, the prognosis will be decreased. So why is it difficult is that echogenicity of liver is almost equal to the lung. So how do we differentiate it? First thing is we'll see whether the liver and lung will be next to direct sciences. Liver to identify next to the lung. How do you differentiate sometimes is indirect things like the hepatic vessels in the thorax, umbilical vein, gallbladder, ductus venosus are also seen in the thorax. Recently, they have entered stomach also as a part of the. Hello. Hello. Audible. Yeah. So recently, they have included stomach also as a part in the evaluation. Earlier, it was only MRI guided. Uh, uh, evaluation recently even the ultrasound also they are doing the stomach evaluation so in that they have done a grading again the grade one is the only abdominal part the stomach is still in its normal position hence it is not visualized in the chest the grade two is the anteriorly placing of the stomach it is close to the chest wall and the third one is the stomach will be towards the heart that is in the mid position and the fourth one is it's almost towards the posteriorly so this is the milder version where majority of the things we see that the anomaly scans, we may not see the stomach uh, penetration, the displacement of the stomach into the thorax. That is why the scans will be missing this at the anomaly level. This is a slide which tells us the prognosis of the things. In these slides, we have taken the 
observed by expected LHR ratio to the liver position, whether the liver is in the thorax or the liver in the abdomen. When, when the observed by LHR value is less than 50%, it is the extreme cases, the survival is very minimal. And when the observed by LHR is more than 45%, whether the liver is in thorax or in the abdomen, the survival rate is better. This is, and this grading is only to the stomach. So when we see the stomach in the grade one, that is the stomach is still in the abdomen, the survival rate is good. The same thing, which was done by the John Hopkins study also, it is, this study also tells the same thing. Whenever the LHR value is less than one, the prognosis is bad, and the O by A LHR of less than 25 is also low prognosis. Role of MRI. This is the one thing we need to consider. When do we go for the MRI and CDH? Usually, when the diagnosis of CDH is done at the earlier level, that is by 16 to 20 weeks at the anomaly level, ultrasound itself is sufficient to follow up the things. But when we are doing at the third trimester level, maybe we should go for an MRI because MRI will predict the better anomalies compared to the ultrasound. And even the MRI will detect the size of the defect. That is the reason we usually suggest MRI once it is diagnosed at 28 to 30, 30 weeks. So it also helps us to differentiate whether it is a CDH or it's an event ratio to know the exact size of the defect. So next comes is the counseling. Counseling plays a major role in the CDH management as per the obstetric perspective. This slide will tell you not only about the uh, counseling of CDH, any anomaly when we see, how do we counsel a couple or the family? First of all, we need to discuss with them about the what is the abnormality and what it is explain in detail about them the abnormality after that we need to tell them what is it associated with is there any along with that any other structural anomalies are there any chromosomal anomalies which needs genetic testing if it is not done or any invasive procedures do we require for them or is it associated with any other non-chromosomal anomalies once we confirm all these things we should tell them if there is any requirement of second opinion by a senior specialist also after the confirmation of the diagnosis, we should also explain the couple if there is any necessity of them uh, for the postnatal surgical procedures, what is the outcome of the surgical procedure and what are the long-term effects after the surgery should be explained to the couple and the family. So how do we counsel a patient in CDH? The same thing in the CDH also, first of all, we should tell them what is a CDH and what are the types of CDH and what is the uh, prognosis of each CDH, uh, different types. So then we ask the couple to, we will have second opinion. That is that we will reconfirm the diagnosis by a senior specialist because the, and because any detailed anomaly scan is required from the specialist who knows the better thing, who can identify the better anomalies, which are, can be associated. So once the diagnosis is reconfirmed and if there are any associated anomalies are identified, then we should counsel them. If the in presence of the aneuploidies, survival is poor, in case of any isolated non-syndromic cases, the survival depends upon the degree of lung hypoplasia and pulmonary hypertension. We all know as the lung, I mean, once the stomach or any thorax, abdomen contents enters the thorax, the lung hypoplasia happens, which results in the increased presence in the vascularity, of, inside vascularity, vascular pressure, so the chances of developing of pulmonary hypertension. So left-sided CDH is usually survival rate ranges from 30 to 80 percent. And the quality of life is good if the primary closure of the defect is achieved. The, the only thing is we need to counsel the couple, the confirmation of the diagnosis, what are the associated anomalies, if it, anything is present. If there is no anomalies, we will, depend, we will decide on the lung head ratio and the liver presence in the thorax. And we also need to count, count, make the patient and the couple to go for a pediatric counseling also so that a pediatric surgeon can give them a better idea what is the outcome of the baby in case if it is planned for the surgery post delivery. So usually what are the frequent questions we do get in the OPDs? What is the reason for missed diagnosis at the anomaly scan level? So as we already know, mild cases, they cannot be identified in the anomaly scans because there not be any shift of the stomach or any abdominal contents into the thoracic region. And the second most reason what we found in the studies are only the thing is when we are not taking a proper sections when we are doing, that is the planes when we are doing the ultrasounds or the anomaly scan, we miss out this diagnosis. What is the, is there any need for invasive procedures? Definitely 
for any diagnosed i mean for any anomaly scan i mean anomaly identified we need to look for the chromosomal levels whether it's a prenatal i mean usually we do prenatal screening double marker and quadruple along with that we definitely need an invasive procedures to rule out the genetic i mean chromosomal reasons next thing is what any long term sequelae post surgery most of the patients after delivery they may develop neurological problems chronic liver lung diseases gastro gastroesophageal reflux diseases and and all these things in neurological gastroesophageal and chronic lung disease are expected post surgery in the long term sequelae the next is the what are the chances of recurrence in the next child so usually it's a monogenic it there is no monogenic uh, disorders are identified I mean any genes are not identified particularly for the cdh so it's a polygenetic only and the recurrence rate so far is less that is around 2% they have found out but they have not found out any particular gene which will cause to the recurrence of the cdh when do we do fetal mri we all know that i have as per the things it is only advised when we have done the identification of the cdh at a later level that is at a 28 to 30 weeks so goal in the antenatal management is confirm the diagnosis usg with special parameters of long volumes to be done fetal mri fetal echo pediatric surgery counseling and prognostication of the outcome will be better and thereby inform decision by the family better so the take home message will be confirm the diagnosis with an expert rule out the associated anomalies invasive process should be done that is karyotyping the multidisciplinary management should be done consultation of the neonatologist pediatric surgeon from the antenatal period and all these things counseling should be counseled and documentation is done so why do we need to do the identification of cdh at the antenatal level because if you have identified the document identified the problem at an early level we can plan the delivery at a better place it's later tertiary center where the all the availability will be there so and the second thing what we should know there is no need to do preterm delivery in case of cdh it's always better to wait full term and then deliver the baby and there is no direct need for the lscs also unless it is obstetric indication so the overall thing is from the obstetric perspective we should remember o by e lhr and liver position are the determinants for the congenital diaphragmatic hernia prognosis thank you thank you dr pranavi for that uh, lucid presentation i think you have covered both the theoretical aspects how do we prognosticate as well as the practical tips on counseling thanks and uh, i think now i would like to invite dr vedar our pediatric surgeon summarize any surgical challenges because most of the uh, and the antenatal stabilization antenatal counseling delivery room stabilization pre op stabilization timing of surgery post op stabilization and follow up has already been covered i would just like to request him to discuss the or summarize the surgical points followed by which we can have a discussion over to you dr vedar thank you so much uh, dr abhishek i hope i am audible to everyone Hello. Yeah. So, uh, very interesting presentation and very uh, comprehensive discussion on the two most common uh, presentations of CDH that we see. One is the index case in which it's uh, antenatally not diagnosed or antenatally not monitored child, which uh, has a very classical presentation of uh, fetal distress, uh, respiratory distress at birth, and Uh, distress on feeding this is a very very uh, classical presentation uh, of cdh and immediately an x-ray was done and we could see that the x-ray showed a clear cut uh, cdh and uh, the management uh, aspect so uh, the other one uh, which madam has highlighted a very typical presentation of cdh in which in the first anomaly scans it's not seen and later on uh, we see it and uh, uh, most of these patients get referred to pediatric surgery at this point at uh, about second trimester around for uh, antenatal counseling so when we see uh, mothers of expect of of, of parents of cdh uh, we only look at the uh, observed over expected lhr that is the most important parameter because that not only tells us as to what kind of a baby we are expecting and also what is the level of care that uh, would be required by this baby Uh, in the post op so if you have a very low over uh, observed over expected lhr then probably this baby is going to uh, require 
uh, higher facilities of uh, HFOB and uh, probably ECMO and all those things. Versus if you have a good uh, uh, ratio, then probably this baby would have a relatively uh, benign uh, phase as, if, as, as in our index case, did not have a lot of uh, PPHN and, and extubated quickly and fed well and went home uh, very well. So the most common questions that the parents ask us uh, at this point of time is, will my child have a normal life? CTH babies per se, once you operate them, once the initial period of PPHN and all those things are taken care, they usually do very well. That means they are expected to have a really normal life, normal life expectancy. Maybe certain uh, uh, activities which demand a lot of lung capacity like swimming or trekking might be a challenge for them. But apart from that, usually they, they're not expected to have any kind of a uh, disability moving forward in life. The other uh, important question is, is, uh, is where to where should we deliver the baby? So uh, always and always the most important treatment uh, parameter which, which determines the outcome is the in utero transfer. That means it's important to identify and stratify the patients of CDH uh, antenatally and uh, transfer them uh, in utero and get the child delivered in a center where there is facilities available to initially uh, resuscitate the child to manage the PPHN and subsequently uh, operate and manage the post-op. Of all the parameters, it is more important to have the, uh, uh, rather than the surgical uh, availability, it's more important to have the PPHN management uh, part of the uh, setup. That is, a nitric oxide should be available, millinone should be available, we should have HFOV. If we have those things, then usually the outcomes are, are very uh, uh, good for CTH. If we don't have those things, then even with a small defect also, we might not be able to manage the child. So there are certain aspects of uh, management of a CDH which I would like to talk, to talk about. First is the timing of surgery. As, as Dr. Sunil has said, almost all babies of CDH will have PPHN. So it's always better to initially stabilize the baby, let the PPHN develop, and then let it settle down and then operate probably 48 hours or 72 hours once the blood gas is little. In our case, the baby identified a little bit late around 48 hours. So the baby was already quite well. So we could operate the next day and, uh, and, and have a good result. The second uh, important point is what, what is the approach, whether we do a, a, th a, a laparotomy or whether we do a thoracotomy or, or is there a minimally invasive approach? So it is entirely dependent upon what is the condition, if the baby is stable or not, and what is the weight. If the baby is more than 2.5 kg baby, very stable, whether it's light, right side or left side, we would love to, we actually prefer to do a thoracoscopic approach in which we put uh, 5 mm and 3 mm cuts, total three ports, and we are able to uh, achieve a good uh, diaphragmatic repair with that. If the baby is slightly uh, less in weight or if there is any uh, 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 hemodynamic or, or respiratory instability, then if it's a left side, we go through a laparotomy. If it's a right side, we do a thoracotomy and do a repair. The size of the defect per se really does not matter much for a surgeon because we always keep a little a mesh on standby. If it's a very big uh, defect, we can usually put a mesh and achieve a good closure. Rather, what matters is how much of uh, lung has developed or how much of intestines is there up in the thorax. Because uh, even though lung development is the more, most important parameter, the other aspect is that the abdominal domain, the abdomen does not develop well for these children. So when we pack all the uh, intestines and all the organs into the abdomen, what happens is that we develop what is called as an abdominal compartment syndrome. That means a lot of gut in a small space. So uh, this is one aspect of post-op man post management, uh, which is often overlooked in, in management of CDH. That is, we have to initially before closing the abdomen, we do ask the anesthetist whether the compliance is good or not. And in the post-op, we like to keep the baby ventilated, intubated for at least 48 hours so that the abdominal muscles can adjust to the uh, to handling the bowel. And also, we uh, put a catheter and we try to monitor the intra-abdominal pressures. And if you have echo facilities, then we look at the uh, uh, vena cava diameter to see whether, whether the child is developing a compartment syndrome or not. Usually, if the child is not developing a compartment syndrome, then they're usually able to feed by 48 to 72 hours. Once they feed in past two, usually we are out of the woods in case of a CDH uh, baby. 
and uh, that being said most of the babies of cdh whether it's a mesh closure whether it's a, it's a it's a primary ap approximation the basic uh, parameter which determines the survivability is pphn and the parameter which de determines pphn is the lung hypoplasia which is measured by the lhr so uh, the take home message is where it's we should identify uh, cdh antenatally there should be a proper LHR done because many times we see LHRs which are on the affected side. As Madam has pointed out, it's not the affected lung to head ratio, it is rather the normal lung to the head ratio because that's the one which is going to ventilate the child later on. Okay, so uh, that has to be an accurate thing. Based on the LHR, we should uh, classify this or stratify the patient and refer them to, to, to the center where we can actually manage this, preferably in utero. And we go for a term delivery and then Take it up from there that's the most important thing there has been a lot of interest uh, on on antenatal management that is uh, our uh, fetal uh, fetal that is uh, endoscopic occlusion of the trachea and an exit procedure but uh, unfortunately the outcomes have not improved even though the hypoplasia part of lung has improved but the overall outcomes has not improved so that is still yet in developmental phase so that would be it and uh, any questions uh, Thank you, Dr. Vedar, for summarizing the surgical challenges. I think the house is now open for any questions or comments. So uh, I have a I have a question, Dr. Abhishek, uh, as to uh, as to management of the PPHN part. So uh, apart from our regular uh, blood gases and all which we do, what is an easy method to, uh, to manage, to, to find out what, how to grade the PPH that the child is having? ECHO has been the very easy method actually, because off late, if you see most of the level three NICUs have a bedside ECHO. And with ECHO, I think we are able to diagnose as well as grade the PPHN. Echo is the easiest way, actually. Any, any other questions or doubts with regards to antenatal diagnosis or You can unmute yourself to ask a question. I think everybody is mute. That's the problem. You, you can unmute yourself and place a question, or you can also place a question in the chat box. I had a question for the obstetrician. Yes, sir. Dr. Shonak, you have to introduce yourself. Uh, this is Dr. Sharnak, pediatric surgeon. Yes, sir. I had a question for you. How many CPH actually have you seen getting normal delivery done? Because you have told that there is no uh, contraindication to the normal delivery. Sir, uh, sir actually, we, this is the first case I have seen in our uh, center. That is the first thing I have seen. After that, only I have no, no. gone through the data. But they were, no one yeah, has so, been, because majority of the cases are not diagnosed antenatally. That is the reason, and uh, which, were which were diagnosed will be already in the tertiary case center, so and they were uh, taken care of them. So as per the data, there was nothing like you have. There is no need to try for, uh, I mean, normal. There nothing like the data has not shown that anything like that, and even they have said you wait till forty weeks, not even to thirty eight weeks. You wait till that baby reaches the forty weeks, then you plan the delivery. If you have an antenatally diagnosed CDH, will you go ahead and do a normal delivery or LSCS? That's my question. See, sir, it's the thing is, if we look at the how the antenatal, I mean, when we are in the labor room, how the baby is, we will be monitoring the baby and then we will take the call because CDH alone is not the reason for me to take for the C section. If the baby's NSTs are fine and the mother is progressing, why do I need to take the surgery? 
No, no, no. I am not telling you need to. I am just telling that whether the practice has changed. I mean, that is what even the theory and data is also telling the same thing. There is no need to take for C-section unless it is a real obstetric indication. Okay, that's my question. So, in future, if we have an antenatally diagnosed CDH and with a normal NST and also, we can go ahead and do a normal yes, delivery. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello, weather sir. This is Venu Gopal. Hi sir. Yeah, nothing sir. I just want to. I think many are there OB and pediatrics. Sir. Uh, about financial counselling. Yes sir. Uh, can you give some idea how much uh, it will be roughly and uh, to stay or and uh, overall? I think uh, many people will be there doing counselling for them. Uh, even antenatally also, it might help, sir. Yes sir. Basically, uh, CDH costing. Uh, per se depends upon uh, how many days of NICU that the baby stays. So mm -hmm. like uh, this are index case, uh, it stayed for about a week, I think, Dr. Abhishek. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, for a week, right? So uh, basically, uh, if, you, if your child, if the baby has, uh, uh, goes for an open surgery, the surgical cost, some, uh, the, the cost of the surgery itself comes up to somewhere around 50 to 60,000 rupees, maybe 70. And, and after that, whatever extra cost is based on the number of days that the baby stays. If they go for a laparoscopic or a thoracoscopic surgery, then the cost goes up accordingly because we do have to get the instruments and all those things. So that would be somewhere around, for the surgery itself, around 1 lakh or 1.2 lakhs like that, based on, uh, on the laparoscopic instrument. And then usually the post-op care, uh, uh, care uh, would, would be the same because laparoscopy does not mean that the number of days or number of stay reduces. It is the same amount of stay whether you do open or lap for the child. Okay. So uh, based on uh, basically, I think Dr. Abhishek will be able to tell us more about the per day stay basically how it is. So if if how much it would be surgery because it's a 70,000 and a seven day stay would um, turn out to be how much? Abhishek? Yeah, yeah. NICU charges it actually depends from unit to unit. And uh, with the current, probably some units charge up to 10,000 per day, some units charge up to 15 to 25,000 per day. Primarily depends on the bed charge. So probably this child stayed for almost for 10 days. So the bill was within 2 lakhs. So for a baby with CDH, I think the bill will be close to 2 lakhs, including surgery as well as pre-op stabilization and post-op NICU stabilization. So basically, if I give you context... For a baby who stays for 10 days with surgery. Yeah, basically, if I give you context, uh, my entire team is here. So uh, we operate in a lot of uh, hospitals in and around Bangalore. So uh, if if I if we do this somewhere in uh, in a tertiary uh, in a corporate setup, it would be around three point five to four, is what the cost would be. Uh, okay. I think Dr. Shonak would agree with me at this, right? Dr. Shonak. Yeah, yeah, if it is a CTH which is uncomplicated, is not giving and you much about of seven days people. stay. Seven days stay, and then in, I think that will go around uh, three to four. Three to five, or if you do it in a in a, a, a charitable hospital, semi-private kind of a setup, it will also come to around one point five. Uh, one point five. It, yeah, probably Baptist will be around a lakh of rupees. That's 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 the pricing everywhere. Okay, thank you, sir. We have one more question in the chat box. The question is, what are the precautions we should take while transporting a child with CDH born in peripheral centers? Sunil, you want to answer this question? Uh, Sunil, you want to answer this question? Yes, yeah, sir. Oh, Sunil, please, go ahead. Uh, the first thing is that if one if diagnosed antenatally, we preferably uh, transfer the child in utero, that is prior to delivery to a, a tertiary center where equipped with uh, good ICU and uh, facility for uh, surgery and uh, pediatric surgeon availability, sir. If not, the, if diagnosed postnatally, uh, better to stabilize, uh, intubate promptly uh, in case the distress is severe. Uh, if needed, Stabilize further in case if, the, if they can treat a PPH in case or a stabilize the pH in that particular uh, NICU uh, and shift. It's well, it always it's always better to 
uh, hemodynamically and res uh, respiratory wise to keep the uh, baby stable prior to shifting, sir. Uh, thanks, Sunil. I think in addition to intubation, you give adequate pseudo uh, analgesia as well prior to transfer so that you can avoid TPHN. Uh, Dr. Abhishek, I would like to add a couple of things. A uh, baby born in periphery, if diagnosed with CDH, uh, so probably they would have missed antenatally. That's why that's the question there. First thing is uh, we should put an NG for the baby, put it on drainage. That is easily available. That's what uh, reduces our respiratory distress to a large extent. We should try and sedate or at least shift the baby in a very quiet and calm way rather than uh, uh, and the And as far as possible, I would personally advise that nowadays we have got what is called as ambulance retrieval system. So let us, it's better to identify the center where the patient is going to and, and plan for a retrieval because that way we can, if required, the baby can be intubated and, and, and shifted under, under uh, because that's a much more controlled environment. That's what I would prefer. Any, any other questions or doubts? I think if there are no questions or doubts, I think I thank our speakers today, Dr. Sunil, Dr. Pranavi, and Dr. Vedat for an interactive session today. I thank our moderators, Dr. Chandrika Anand, madam, and I think she had to rush for a delivery, and Dr. Vandana, ma'am, I think she also had to rush for a delivery. So thank you, everybody, for joining. We'll come back again the second week of July with an interesting topic. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Abhishek. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, sir.